Now that you've hopefully read the chapter I assigned for this module and understand a little bit about policy theory, I want to walk you through one of the models mentioned in your reading in a bit more detail. And that model is the Advocacy Coalition Framework. It's one of the more common models used by political scientists to study the policymaking process. And I'm introducing the Advocacy Coalition Framework to you here with the goal of having you start to think in terms of the framework's concepts when you read the assigned articles about California's housing policy this week. All right, so here's a schematic of the Advocacy Coalition Framework. Now I know it's a lot to take in at first, uh, but we'll go through this bit by bit to understand the components of this framework. So obviously this is a bit more complicated than the policy stages model uh, that we learned about in the previous video. Uh, but this extra complexity of the Advocacy Coalition Framework is meant to provide a more realistic and comprehensive view of the policymaking process. There are a few things in particular that the Advocacy Coalition Framework, or as it's usually referred to, the ACF, sets out to do. So first, the ACF accounts for the fact that government policy is stable most of the time. In other words, government policy usually changes incrementally or not at all. But occasionally, policy can change pretty rapidly and substantially. And the ACF helps us understand the conditions under which policy stability and policy change are most likely. Second, the ACF tries to account for the role of both people and structures in the policy process. In other words, policy results from the actions and choices of people who are active in a particular policy area. But the actions and decisions of these people are constrained and guided by factors that are outside of their individual control. Things like the rules of government institutions or broadly held social and cultural values about what types of government action are considered appropriate. And finally, and this is probably the biggest contribution of the Advocacy Coalition Framework, the ACF simplifies the messy politics surrounding the policy process by identifying policy subsystems in which people congregate into competing coalitions to try to get their policy preferences adopted by government. So looking at policy subsystems more closely now, the term policy subsystem gets at the idea that the policy process is not very centralized among a few key decision makers on every issue, but instead is distributed among different networks of policy actors who are active on different issues. So unlike the Schoolhouse Rock video version of policymaking, in which every policy idea gets processed through the same group of decision makers in Congress, policymaking is actually much more fragmented, where the group of influential players on, let's say, the issue of air quality will be very different from the key players involved in housing policy. So each policy issue is considered as its own mini policymaking system or subsystem. And within those subsystems, you have policy actors or people who are actively trying to shape government policy on that particular issue area. Policy actors can be members of interest groups or government officials or concerned citizens who show up to public hearings on particular issues. And the Advocacy Coalition Framework asserts that the actions of policy actors within subsystems is organized by coalitional behavior. In other words, people who are active in a particular policy area generally tend to organize or congregate themselves into a small number of coalitions, usually only two or three. And these coalitions compete with one another to try to get their preferred policies enacted by government. According to the ACF, the glue that holds coalitions together is shared policy beliefs. Basically, members of a coalition share general goals for what the future of their policy issue area will look like in the future, and what types of government policies will help them reach those goals. Coalitions use the resources at their disposal, which can include things like money, media attention, public support, technical expertise, 
and relationships with government decision makers to try to win decisions by governmental authorities that reflect the coalition's policy beliefs. So as you read this week's articles on housing policy in California, see if you can identify some initial signs of different coalitions that are active in the housing policy area in California. I know it's just a few articles, but the quotes that policy actors supply to journalists can be a fairly useful quick and dirty way of learning a little bit about the policy beliefs of coalitions. Another key component of the advocacy coalition framework that I want to highlight for you are a group of factors the framework labels as relatively stable parameters. Basically, these are things that act as a break or a restriction on rapid policy change. So long as these factors remain relatively stable, major changes in government decisions will be hard to achieve, even if there are coalitions in a subsystem desperately trying to create big policy changes. These relatively stable parameters include things like the basic attributes of the problem area. So for instance, in terms of housing policy in California, one barrier that advocates for policy change face is that housing in California has been expensive for decades. It can sometimes seem like it's just part of life in the golden state. It's only when people perceive a change, like, oh my goodness, housing is getting way more expensive. The problem is getting worse. That's when the opportunity for policy change opens up. The basic distribution of natural resources would be something like land ownership patterns in the state. For instance, the fact that there's very little publicly owned land in the state's population centers limits government's ability to quickly build large scale public housing as a possible solution to housing affordability. Relatedly, fundamental soci socio-cultural values and social structure place limits on how much or dramatically policy can change. Again, with the housing issue, California has a long tradition of local control over housing policy. As you'll read with some of the quotes in the assigned articles this week, people can get really, really upset when they feel the state is taking away their community's power to determine what types of housing can be built in their area. And finally, the basic constitutional structure or rules set the threshold for how much agreement or consensus has to be achieved in order to change policy. As mentioned in the previous video, the legislative process in California includes multiple veto points, making it a pretty high bar in terms of agreement in order to enact policy change into law. A last component of the ACF that I wanna highlight for you is what the framework calls external or system events. Whereas the relatively stable parameters we just learned about tend to limit policy change, external or system events tend to open up opportunities for new policy or for policy change. For instance, changes in socioeconomic conditions can act as a shock that changes the balance of power between competing coalitions and policy subsystems. The Rolling Stone article I've assigned for you this week highlights the rise of homelessness among working people in California. This can change perceptions of the problem of homelessness and housing affordability in a way that makes policy change more likely. Changes in public opinion can alter the balance of power between competing coalitions and open up the potential for policy change. Changes in systemic governing coalition has to do with the partisan balance in government and the platforms that winning candidates ran on. So the fact that California has a Democratic legislature and a Democratic governor who ran on a platform of addressing the state's housing shortage makes it much more likely that policy change will occur. That's not to say that all Democrats agree on housing policy or that there are clear Democratic and Republican positions on housing. Housing is actually one of those issues where there are interesting coalitions across party lines. It's just that under single party control, the majority party is much more likely to work toward consensus to show the voters they can get something done, especially on an issue in which their leader in the governor's office has made it a priority. Since they can't place blame on the Republicans if they fail to pass new laws, the Democrats have sort of an extra incentive to come to agreement on policy change in the housing area. <laughs> 
So now you know a little more about the concepts that political scientists use to make sense of the policymaking process. I hope that these concepts have given you at least some new ways of looking at or analyzing what you read about policy issues in the news. The Advocacy Coalition framework in particular cues us in to pay attention to the stories or narratives that people tell about particular issues, to identify coalitions or teams, if you will, and what their beliefs are. It also helps us to assess the relative likelihood of stability in a policy area or the potential for change. So as you read the articles on housing policy in California, please keep these questions in mind. What coalitions are active in housing policy and what are their policy beliefs? What are the factors limiting housing policy change in California? And what factors might make policy change more likely?